from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Happy birthday, dear Alexa, by John Keir Cross. I am essentially, I think, a simple man. I make this statement with no kind of false modesty. It is only something that has become apparent as my long life has gone on and I have failed so often until it is too late to comprehend the small complexities with which we are all surrounded from day to day. I shall even be simple in setting down this particular incident in my life. I shall have no skill in any kind of storytelling about it and so you will see through it all long before I may teach a particular point which someone more skillful in the art of writing would have been able to mask for dramatic effect. You will see through Hare's terrible secret from the start, I dare say, where I never did till it all was almost over. His shop was in a small side street. From the start, I should perhaps have suspected something sinister from the very air and atmosphere of the place. Yet naturally, on such a quest, one hardly expected anything other than a slightly unusual flavor, shall I say? Certainly the other shops I had previously visited were also peculiar in one way or another, even the one that was very large and medicated in Marlebone. No doubt, the association from the commodity I was seeking predisposed one to subjective impressions somewhat macabre. The commodity in question was to be a gift for my young cousin Alexa. It was in fact to be a birthday gift. How strange, a birthday gift. Yet one that would be curiously welcome. One hardly quite knew where to begin. It is, after all, not the kind of gruesome relic that one is likely to wish to purchase every day. One had certainly no realization that there even was a positive shortage of the articles. With subsequent visions of patient queues of earnest students assembled outside, a supplier momentarily well stocked. But it all was so. And after a while there came even to be a sense of mild excitement in the quest, as source after source was explored unavailingly, yet more and more clues were uncovered as to possible further milieu for inquiry. You will note, no doubt, I realize it myself reading back this laborious opening of mine, laborious since, as I've said, I am no skilled writer, that I have probably from some lingering sense of delicacy so far avoided any open mention by name of the commodity's nature. Let me come to it boldly and straightly then. The object I sought to purchase was none other than a human skeleton. And the explanation for the horrid search is simplicity itself, as again you will plainly have guessed. My cousin was a medical student engaged conscientiously in a meditation upon the mysteries of anatomy. I do not exaggerate, incidentally, when I say that at the period of which I write so inexpertly, the objects in question were in great demand and short supply. I had even read a mildly humorous article in the Times long before, to that very effect, one of the inimitable fourth leaders of that notable journal, which still, behind the facade of some light-heartedness, announced the undoubted fact that for one reason or another, skeletons for medical study purposes had become extremely difficult to obtain, and those that were available, even at third or fourth hand, as their owners progressed beyond the necessity of further study, were outside the purses of most young medicos. It was where I thought I might be of some assistance. Alexa had been in the search for some time, only to find that indeed the prices were outrageous, where I'm most fortunately endowed with this world's goods, through a pleasing inheritance some years previously, might be able to be of some worthwhile family assistance, and with Alexa's birthday not far in the offing, might also, the mild jest may be permitted, kill two birds, as it were, with one somewhat costly stone. My first difficulty, however, was to know even where to begin, 
as I think I have already stated, but by dint of some discreet inquiry among medical friends, even of Alexa during a supposedly social visit only, I eventually found myself on the long trail calling one bright spring morning at that large and distinguished looking shop in Marleybone. I was interviewed by a young man of superior spartness with a curiously clean and, I've, I may say so, sterile look. As I moved forward to confront him, I found myself almost slipping on the excessively polished linoleum beneath my feet. All around me were glistening machines and implements of unknown medical functionalism, trays and boxes of neat cold forceps, curiously shaped scissors, small knives, contrivances spouting arrays of red rubber tubings. At the back, where the light perhaps fortunately was somewhat shady, there were some shelves of silent bottles with nameless shapes afloat in their spiritous deaths. About the whole place was an elusive odor of linoleum polish and formalin. I found myself oppressed, but the thought of young Alexis' forthcoming pleasure sustained me. The assistant inclined a somewhat courteous head with a murmured request that I should state my requirement. I want, I began with some initial nervousness, I want to purchase, um, not for myself, you understand, for a friend, a cousin, in fact. I uh, had wanted to inquire about the possibility of obtaining, at that moment, as I glanced somewhat timidly about me, I saw calmly regarding me from a small pedestal, a prime specimen of the object of my very search. The disinterested glare of the hollow orbs unnerved me a little. Then I was able to give a small exclamation of satisfaction as I gestured toward it. A skeleton, sir? The young man's tone held a trace. I thought of professional sorrow, as if almost I were a near relative of the deceased, we both not contemplated, swaying a little on its suspending wires. I remember reflecting, even in the moment, how unexpectedly small we are, untrammeled at last by flesh. Those little spindly bones of ours, so frail seeming against the might of the world, the perpetual grin of our hapless mouths behind whatever expression of grief or soft sentiment our lips might have once worn, our dry small cage of a chest, enclosing hearts that once throbbed deliriously in joy or passion, our boxy little skulls within whose confines noble thoughts may once have raced, whole symphonies or epics been composed, the plans of great cathedrals limbed, so what my simple thoughts until I became aware that the young man was still speaking in his smoothly modulated way. Articulated, of course? Of course, I nodded. Unacquainted with the terminologies, I assumed that the expert before me must have some profound purpose in his of course. Besides, I recollected Alexa having said something, too, about this need for articulation in the article. Somewhat in this manner, perhaps, went on the young man gravely, stepping forward toward our solitary companion and touching a wire stretched almost invisibly along the spine. Instantly, with a small dry rustling, hardly more than a whisper through the antiseptic silence, he who once had been executed a deaf, brief convulsion of all his members simultaneously. He quivered and revolved with a delicate waving of arms, an inclination of legs, a pointing of slender toes, he engaged in a total arabesque, a chilly mechanical ecstasy of interrelated bones and silver pivotal pins through all his tiny joints. And as I started back a little, involuntarily apprehensive, the young man beside me said reverentially, in such a tone as I might once have used in my distant youth in a contemplation of Madame Pavlova, no less. Beautiful, oh, beautiful, such poise, such balance, sir, such exquisite coordination. Then, with a further humble moment, before the great dancer, now slowly settling to no more than a lingering, wavy tremor, he turned to me suddenly briskly. I'm sorry, sir, deeply sorry. We are quite out of stock. Nothing at all, I asked, as one might ask in the normal course of day-to-day -day shopping, when confronted with a shortage of, say, summer shirtings during the holiday season or warm underwear with the approach of winter nothing sir our supplies are very limited the demand of late has been quite remarkable to what i asked academically do you attribute such a curious state of i had almost said trading 
then change to shortage in this line. It is difficult to say, sir. At one time we carried almost more of the articles in our stockroom than we had space for. We frequently had to dismember them entirely so as to be able to find accommodation. For, as you will understand, it is an easier matter to group, say, all the tibias, all the fibulae in one shelf with all the metacarpals in another and so forth than to pack the fully assembled items together with any, uh, well, comfort. I groped a little at his undoubtedly strange use of the word comfort, visualizing that unimaginable stockroom somewhere below and far away, beyond the shady bottles on the farther shelves, perhaps. You haven't by any chance, and I hesitated again, wondering how one might convey the possibility of an under-the-counter purchase, recollecting one's wartime habits in acquiring of tobacco or whiskey, for example. Nothing at all, sir, he said severely. We think sometimes that it may all be due to the health service in some indefinable way. No doubt that people are living longer, perhaps. No doubt, I said vaguely. Or even that patients are tending to die in their beds rather than in the unnamed wards of hospitals. We had some useful connections in the better times with the riverside morgues, for instance. But somehow suicides are less frequent than they were. Or rather, should I say, the present-day practitioners tend to stay at home rather more. The genial sleeping draft overdose has come somewhat to the fore, and so one is more in the position of being found by relatives or friends and given, as they say, a decent burial. He contrived to inject an odd flavor of distaste and even disapproval into his tone. These things move in trends, of course, he concluded with a sigh. One can hardly predict or even comprehend a general movement in trade, and it was never, of course, the kind of commodity that could be, well, as one might say, made to measure. It is hardly a case for the assembly line. Plastics? I murmured tentatively, with visions of a fortune to be made in a factory established somewhere in the Midlands, the young men and women streaming to work each morning on bicycles, the staff canteens, the sports welfare clubs, the whole great machinery of modern industry geared toward meeting the strange demand. Yet I realized in an instant that I had made an immense faux pas. He regarded me with an ill-concealed pity. It would hardly, perhaps, serve, sir, in our profession. We must observe the proprieties. We are dealing, I think, with fundamentals. Plastics would be hardly, well, worthy, shall I say. There remain one more possibility. Small as he had made me feel, I said boldly with a somewhat forlorn gesture. Perhaps, perhaps, that model there. He froze to an immobility as marked as that of the now still subject of our whole discourse. I beg your pardon, sir. It is for exhibition only. It has been with us since the initial establishment of our whole business. It is in fact, and was bequeathed as such, so that, as he put it in his will, he might constantly be in a position to watch our progress. It is, in fact, our original founder. Good morning, sir. I am sorry not to have been able to have been of more assistance. I crept into the bright sunshine. With one backward apologetic glance, I saw him stare after me with an expression of supreme distaste on his face. I could have sworn in the shadows there that he then turned for a moment and bowed to that small, dangling shape that at once had trotted so briskly, so joyously, through the very medicated doorway from which I had that instant emerged. I told you, I think that I was, and indeed am, an unsophisticated man. I will not worry you with a full account of my attempts to find another one. At every turn I met only frustration. I visited shops of a like nature too, but less opulent than that veritable temple in Marylebone. But the tale was constantly the same, a hundred assistants some sympathetic, some brusque, some positively rude, announced the identical dismal state of affairs. Skulls? Yes, occasionally. Isolated tibiae or fibulae? Possibly. Complete feet? More rarely. But still at least remotely. Pelvises? By some strange freak. Pelvises by the score. But fully articulated? No, sir. One very aged proprietor of a small supplier of Holborn told me gloomily, being more courteous than most dealers that I had encountered. I've been in the trade, man and boy, sir, for sixty years, and more. 
and I've known nothing like it. Nothing. Not since the days of the great Uman Ert shortage in O2. And what was that? I inquired, offering him a cigar which he took with some absence of mind. His eyes mixed nostalgically on that distant past. Terrible times, sir, terrible. In the old days, we done quite a trade on the side in Uman Ertz. Etch Etches, as we used to call them. Pickled them in acid and such, and used to put them up in handy little jars that we bought wholesale from the jam factory. Down the road, changed the labels, of course. You won't remember them old times of the pawning days. I shook my head. By this time, you will comprehend I had acquired a positive interest, if not a thorough fascination for the whole subject. The pawning days. The unimaginable pawning days. When you was down and out, said my informant, leaning confidentially over a counter littered with second-hand syringes, scalpels, tweezers, stethoscopes, and the like, which I don't suppose you've never been in all your life, sir, nor never hoped to, but when you was down and out in them old days, and you'd pawned your watch and your overcoat and your spare elastic sides and such, and the old rolled gold medallion with your mother's picture inside and a lock of hair, there was still one thing left that you could pawn, and it was yourself. Yourself? I said noncommittally. Yourself, sir. You went to St. William's Hospital, like, and you said, Here I am. What's left of me? And they said, Good, sign here. And they gave you a form, sir, and it said on it that in exchange for a five-pound note, you hereby bequeathed your body to medical science for research, when such time should arrive as you passed on, see? Now, if you signed another form which said as you'd never smoked or had a drink and never would, then you got another fiver, and that made ten. So off you went with your catch, see, and that was you fixed. But if times got better for you, if you maybe came into a fortune or such, you could always go and get yourself out again. And if you were a five-pound job, that would cost eight. See, because they had to have their profit. But if you're a ten-pounder, it was eighteen. Because they reckoned that if you didn't smoke and didn't drink, they'd have to wait anyways. And so the interest was higher, like. But there wasn't many as was able to redeem themselves that way. And so there was the great time for HHs and skeletons, too, see? And what happened in O2 to put an end to it all, I asked. Reckon the hospitals got wise to it, see? Cause after St. William started it, every other hospital ran a scheme too. And there was chaps that made a regular living out of going round them all and signing papers right, left, and center. So that when the time came, nobody knew what tibia belonged to who and what fibula belonged to the other. So no two, they all stopped simultaneous. And there we were. Not an eich eich in the place. There weren't. He stayed gloomily contemplating that terrible period of slump and then shook himself. Oh, well, time's picked up a bit after all in the 20s, I suppose, because of the fashionable suicide wave. See, but now they've settled back again. Now the folks are more homekeeping and we've the health service and such. And his more homely way, he repeated the curious argument of my supercilious friend of Marylebone. I left him at last with a desolate conviction that the day would never come when I would be able to provide poor Alexa with a birthday present, particularly with that birthday looming constantly nearer and nearer. He gave me only one word of possible comfort. Take my advice, sir, and don't go around the medical suppliers. We're all in the same boat, see? Pawn shops. That's the ticket. Pawn shops? Yes, sir. Them or the second-hand lads down side streets. You see, the only time one of them there comes on the market is when some young student chap like this cousin of yours you was telling me about gets hard up sudden-like. So they round the corner to uncle with what's his name slung over their shoulder. And that's good for a tenor, you know. Because with things as they are, uncle can't sell them again for as much as 30 or 40 to chaps like you as is on the search, see? Mind you, mostly they're pretty old and falling to bits by the time that gets to uncle. But, even so, there's sometimes something young and tasty-like will turn up. So you just go on that tack, sir. There's a little shop in Camberwell. 
I can give you the address of that that's been running them theirs for quite a time as a specialty. If you mention my name, he'll see you straight. He gave me the address and I visited Camberwell. And so eventually the long trail drew towards its conclusion as I came in sight of Mr. Hare. But not at first. Not still for some little time. I had some further dismal rounds to perambulate. By this time the tension was rising within me to some positive degree of discomfort. The birthday was drawing closer and closer, yet still I saw little chance of success. And something else had arisen to occasion worry. Something which might have held some element of the ludicrous were not for the danger I saw in it that my whole scheme of a pleasant surprise for my young cousin might topple to desolate failure. As I moved from shop to shop on my quest, I had sometimes been aware of occasional faces becoming increasingly familiar, mostly of young men standing beside me at the various counters awaiting their turn or approaching them as I withdrew. From a muttered remark once overheard, it one day dawned on me that these were none other than seekers like myself, young medicos who were also on the trail, chasing the elusive skeletons from shop to shop as I was. It was a simple step toward the further apprehensive thought that even Alexa might be searching among these others, that there was consequently a chance, however remote a chance, that I might be forestalled. The consideration quite appalled me. With the final examinations comparatively near at hand, Alexa's need for a skeleton to study was growing quite imperative. It was why I had known from the first that my projected gift would be so singularly welcome to that studious cousin of mine. I had never disclosed my intention in all gifts. I have always felt in my simple way there should be an element of surprise. It was more than likely that in what little time could be scared from study, Alexa would be seeking to obtain the curious heart's desire I also sought. And if our paths should cross, I had veritable confirmation of the danger on the very day of my visit to the little shop in Camberwell that had been recommended by the friendly dealer in Holborn. At the very moment of my approach to it, I saw Alexa's familiar figure hurrying out. I concealed myself in a convenient doorway, then made my own way forward. The shop was small and dark, a misery of ancient junk of every description, the entire stock piled high in the single evil-smelling room. Great heaps of soiled clothes, piles of cracked hockery, broken tables, crooked chairs, but as far as I could see, no skeletons. No, sir, said the dealer gloomily, when I made my need known to him. Not in two years, I ain't seen one. Old Joe, up Holborn Way, was right, though. Used to deal him regular. It's just that somehow, though so hard to come by now, I've give it up. Tell me, I said hastily, that young student who came in a moment before me. I think I know the face. As a matter of interest, the dealer smiled before I completed the very sentence. Exactly the same, sir, he said. I was just thinking how queer it was. One of one of them there, too, and fact there's several been in lately. Might be worth my while to start up trade again, if I can even lay my hands on the stuff. Only thing is, and he suddenly shrugged, I doubt if it would even be worth it. These young folks, these days hardly have a chance, have they? Why? I asked. Cash, see? Even if I got one or two in, I could hardly sell them under 40 or 45 smackers. And it ain't every yunker of a student could lay hands on that amount of cash. He was right, of course. And I saw a sudden ray of hope. From my knowledge of Alexa's resources, it was only too plain that the purchase would be quite out of the question. Whereas I had only to trace the one physical object, one single skeleton, reasonable repair, and of course, articulated, poor Alexa had to go further and find one at the very most costing 10 or 15. And with a demand as it plainly was, there was little likelihood of that. I acquired a new confidence, yet still had a lingering far off edge of apprehension. I sped from shop to shop, from Camberwell to Kentish Town on an elusive trail, thereafter to a pawnbroker in Cheapside, who had been recommended to a, a tangled young yard in the minories, to an aged surly crone almost invisible behind the piled high horrors of a used clothing store at Rotherhithe. It was she who gave me 
with some reluctance at first in address and Pimlico, then suddenly peering closely at me, cackled quite hideously as she repeated it. I found the side street in a maze of crooked alleys and vennels behind Sloan Square, saw the name in blistered paintwork above the most wretched shop my eyes had ever confronted, W. Hare General Dealer. Having learned my lesson in Camberwell, I reconnoitered the neighborhood with some care for a possible sign of Alexa, then satisfied pushed forward and entered. A cracked bell tinkled dismally through a musty dark silence. A small, withered creature wearing a black skull cap came forward from the shadows. I babbled my request in some haste, anxious to escape from the whole unpleasant place as quickly as I could. I had even turned to the door again, so conditioned had I become to constant, bleak refusal. But suddenly my distaste for my surroundings was swallowed in a great wave of relief as I heard Hare's thin and melancholy voice. Why, yes, sir, I think I might be able to accommodate you. If you will give me a few particulars, perhaps? For all his small repulsiveness, I might almost in that exciting moment have embraced him. He leaned closely to me across his piled counter. I perched as well as I could on a chair which, although plainly set out for the convenience of customers, still bore a price sticker, seven and six. With my eyes a little accustomed to the gloom, I found myself gazing into the most horrible face I have ever seen. It was itself almost a skull. The lips were thin and cracked, drawn in a perpetual rictus grin from teeth that were totally black. The skin stretched yellowly across his high cheekbones, was so taut as almost to seem transparent. There was a momentary horrid temptation to set out a finger to poke through it bloodlessly, as if it were parchment. The eyes were pale and curiously glazed with no spark of life in them. Hooded beneath crusted and roomy lids, the man was a living corpse. And from him, or from the monstrous assembly of mysteries in that shop of his, there was a smell unconsciously repulsive. What his true nature was, I had no notion, yet it was a condensation somehow of a smell I had encountered before. Somehow animal, somehow associated with, with what? I am a simple man. Perhaps in that moment, if I had been a little more worldly wise for all my years, however, you will realize, he was saying in his soft, toneless voice, that it may take a day or two, perhaps, before I can lay my hands on a specimen. I have none in stock, as it happens. How long? I asked impatiently. With my first relief now over, I was only anxious again to escape from the oppressive atmosphere of that dark and evil corner of London. A week, shall we say. I must negotiate with my contacts. A week? Great heavens, man, I almost shouted. I can't wait a week. It's for a... Yet I hesitated. It seemed grotesque suddenly, even in that place so grotesque itself, to announce that the object was required for a gift. I was mentally calculating dates and realized that in all my general excitement I had had an impression of time more pressing than it actually was. A week from the 4th would be the 11th, the very day itself of the birthday. You could guarantee it in a week, I asked. Most certainly, indeed, quite definitely, sir. Articulated, of course. Articulated, I said. And, as to size, would you require something on the larger side or the smaller, perhaps? The thing was absurd, of course. I could only stare at him for a moment. He spoke in his toneless way as a tailor might, discussing one next suit. He had a small, much-fingered notebook on the counter before him and held over it the grim stub of a pencil and fingers quite hideously crooked, all marked and burned with the strange yellow stains. It's, uh, it hardly matters, I said, somewhat lamely. I feel now in something of an anticlimax after all my tension. My aim, my only aim, was to buy the thing. It was even absurd, after everything I had been through, to discover that there might be such a thing as a choice in the matter. I would suggest small, sir, he said smoothly, writing carefully. They are somewhat easier for me to obtain and are, of course, more portable. So... And a male or female? Again, I could only stare. The choice was still more bizarre. Was there even any difference? Alexa, 
had never once suggested any kind of preference beyond a dim recollection of some biblical lore about more or fewer ribs i could not conceive of any vital reason why one sex should be more or less suitable for the purposes of study than the other he saw my hesitation and fluted quietly then if i may suggest again sir female they also are a little easier for me to obtain and besides in the thought of the more delicate flesh once enclosing them he broke off his intolerable leer as he saw the expression on my face i believe i might almost have struck him you will require a pack sir he asked even a little hastily turning the dangerous corner i have a consignment of suitable lightweight cardboard boxes i usually use for the purpose the very question of transport had never occurred to me i had had a far notion in the earlier days of the search of an arrangement with carter patterson or some such firm of conveyors of general merchandise i saw now that if i was collecting the gift on the very day i was also having to deliver it i would have to remove it and transport it myself were such things heavy i wondered would the box fit comfortably into a taxi again it was as if he read my thoughts you will find it very light and easily carried sir if i might suggest a taxi cab when you call i nodded again and rose yes pack then i said abruptly but i should like to examine it of course before i take it of course sir it was my intention i shall have it ready a week from today and it will be a matter of moments to enclose it in the box after your examination he smiled with a hollow malevolence and shut the notebook with a snap and the price sir shall we say fifty it was larger than i had anticipated even knowing the general situation but i could ill afford hesitation this time with the end so happily at last in sight very well fifty guineas sir guineas thank you sir and if i may suggest it since you will be taking the article away with you cash sir rather than a check cash mr hare thank you sir i feel quite certain that you will be completely satisfied good evening sir a week from today at shall we say eleven o'clock in the morning perhaps if that is convenient i left him bowing across the counter his yellow hands clasped tightly the tassel of his skull cap dangling over his thin hooked nose i stumbled around silent heaps of rubbish of monstrous vases set on pedestals dead marble busts of no conceivable value tall looming bric-a-brac stands and outmoded victorian bamboo work poker work repulsively carved walnut behind me the bell tinkled faintly as i achieved the blessed air away from the eternal smell and hurried from the shop as quickly as i could move w hare general dealer it was the name indeed more than any other circumstance that i found curiously lingering to haunt me as the week passed by in a strange indolence after all the fear of my quest from that barren and aseptic temple in marylebone to the dingy horrors of the little shop in pimlico i found myself strangely repeating at odd moments simply w hare w hare w hare and seeking some elusive association as elusive in its different way as the odor from the man which has so oppressed me yet whatever i might feel about his unpleasantness his positive evil indeed as i recollected his whole essence in that dusky place leaning forward over his notebook whatever i might feel i had also to recognize that the man had saved me and in that thought as the week went on i regained some measure of delight i had exaggerated my simple mind had grown infected through its piling disappointments through the half ludicrous gruesomeness of the whole adventure when i encountered hair again in the clear light of day his warped grotesqueness would reveal itself only as something subjective creeping through my own mind in a consideration of the macabre nature of the goods purveyed he was even no doubt a simple man like myself of quiet taste and lonely habits on the eve my excitement mounted to a pitch where i could not sleep i lay tossing for some hours reflecting on the pleasure i was to give next day i took a mouthful of brandy and when after all it did not have the soporific effect i usually expect from it i turned to my bedside bookshelf for consolation from my favorite dickens 
It was when I read the passages referring to the nefarious secret occupation of the good Jerry Cruncher in the immortal tale of two cities that I suddenly, with a small mortal chill, recalled the association in the name of that general dealer of mine in Pimlico. Jerry Cruncher, the Resurrectionist. Those other notorious real-life resurrectionists in the old Edinburgh of a hundred and fifty years ago, Burke and Hare. Burke and Hare. I almost laughed aloud in the suddenly realized folly of it all. The thing was a coincidence and an association no more. Nevertheless, it made me lose for once my taste for the master, and I tossed the book aside, seizing instead another favorite, a volume of the enchanting short stories of the good O. Henry and opening it by another coincidence, an altogether happier one, at that famous little masterpiece, The Gift of the Magi. In its lulling, sentimental influence, I fell asleep at last, and woke to a bright and cheerful morning, all horror vanished. The mood still lingered as I directed my cab driver to the little street in Pimlico. Indeed, and indeed my fears and imaginings had been the merest shadows. The very shop in the bright sunlight was almost cheerful in its ridiculous window display of old rugs and tarnished silverware, its shelves of outspread books at three pence and six pence per volume. I entered it blithely, determined against any recurrence of the old depression, and found Hare already awaiting me, his hands as always clasped before him, his skull cap tasseled dangling. The smell was still about me, but I hardly noticed it, was determined at least to ignore it. There was little time, indeed, to notice anything in the sudden contemplation in that magic moment of the object at last of all my searching, for there, set against the end of the counter, was the beautiful thing itself. And you know, in a curious way, it even was quite beautiful to me at that moment, even apart from all the pleasure of its finding, the further pleasure it would give. In itself, it had a strange beauty. The slightly yellowed bones so cunningly fitted, the gleam here and there of the tarnished silver articulation pins and wires, not the face, perhaps, or the lack of face, a skull, can never be beautiful, but somehow the whole marvelous framework of it, once the supports of the very uttermost marvel of all God's universe. The dealer has set it in one of those tall, specially made cardboard boxes of his, the lid of it waiting in readiness on the floor. He asked if I wished to examine the articulation more closely, but I shook my head. Apart from my inexpertness, I knew at a glance that the thing was as perfect a specimen as could be obtained. I almost chuckled to little harmless hair, and my delight as he set to fitting the lid in position and tying the whole long parcel for me with a white new string strangely out of place in that shop of dingy second hadness. I counted out the notes I had obtained from my bank on the way to Pimlico. I had found that I had no ten shilling notes, and cheerfully, as Hare fumbled in a pocket, for change cried. Leave it so, Mr. Hare. At fifty-three, you deserve it. In its box, the skeleton was smaller than it had even seemed before. I had a recurrence of my philosophic thoughts from Marylebone, and it was, after all, quite curiously light, as Hare had said. I could carry it with the greatest ease to the waiting taxi. I mark, sir, he said, as he opened his tinkling door for me, a small H in pencil at the head end, so that you can keep it upright as you carry it before unpacking. It will avoid damage to the articulation. It was a small and friendly touch, I felt, and I smiled to him as he stooped in a final bow to me on the pavement. The girl who lived with Alexa opened the door of the flat to me. She was an engaging new ball young creature I had always felt named Miriam. I propped the box, head upward, of course, against the lintel smiling at her, yet noticing, too, that she wore an unexpected worried look. Alexa isn't in, she said, and my triumphant moment vanished. I built so carefully to it, so carefully, and my simplicity had never occurred to me to confirm that my young cousin would be available to receive my gift. I had a thought to go away and come back. To ask if I might wait, it was essential that the presentation should be carried out by myself, and not by proxy, after all, that I had gone through. But Miriam was speaking again. It's been worrying me to death, she said. Of course, we only live together, and I naturally can't be expected to be given a note of all Alexa's movements. But to have gone away for so long without a single word? She broke off almost petulantly. 
regarding me in the gloomy small quarter. For so long? I asked dazed a little. A week? Nearly enough, and not a single word. It's too bad. I wonder if I had my first inkling even then in my simplicity. I gestured rather lamely to this tall package. It was to have been a birthday gift, I said desolately. Miriam smiled. Of course. I'd forgotten the date. Alexa must surely come back home for that. Do you want to leave it? Yes, I said. I'll leave it. I turned away. There was no other immediate emotion in me, I think, but a great detached sadness over my own inability through my simplicity to comprehend, after all the years, the ironic bitterness of the bright world in which we live. I reflected, too, I believe, on the strangeness of coincidence, that of all the tales in the world I should have been reading the previous evening, the sweetly melancholy one of O. Henry, about the people who all unwittingly gave presents that can no longer be of any value to the recipients. If you should see Alexa, cried Miriam after me, tell her to let me know at least when she's coming home. My foot, as I turned, had caught the edge of the package, still leaning against the lintel. With a small whispering from its jostled contents, it now fell forward into the hallway where Miriam stood, rocking gently for a moment at her feet. Alexa, I said into infinity, has come home.